Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of John, and we're going to pick up where we left off last time. It'll be chapter 5, verse 16. Uh, if you have not seen the uh, previous studies on John, uh, I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, they, they're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, before we get started, though, uh, let me ask uh, Brother Eric and Brother Stephen to introduce themselves. Hello again. It's me again, the whole mole. And today's thunder is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay. <laughs> Amen. I love that, and I definitely can't wait to go into more detail on that in about uh, 50 or so minutes. But either way, my name is Stephen, you know, known as Stephen Rivers TV here on YouTube, and again, just looking forward to another awesome night of, you know, fellowship, learning, and spreading the gospel. Uh, well, Brother Eric, you know, when you put up your verses there, your message, uh, it reminded me that... Um, uh, when we did our study on uh, creeds, you know, we just started the new study comparing all the various Christian creeds, and on that video, there's a comment from a, a, a great beloved brother, uh, God's Truth Ministries is the name of his channel. I'm hoping eventually he'll his time, he'll get enough free time that he can join us here, but uh, he made a comment and mentioned you, Brother Eric. Did you see it? I must have missed that, Brother Luke. Well, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I thought you'd like to hear. He's, he said he really enjoyed this whole study on creeds. He's looking forward to the, the rest of it. But he says he rest, especially loved uh, Brother Eric's creed that he put up. Well, that's great because I just happen to have it right here. <laughs> Believe. What is it? Uh, Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and love one another. Okay. Okay. All right, let's get started. Um, uh, I'll read uh, the verses first in the KJV, and then we'll also look at it in the Amplified, uh, because the Amplified translation is, is like reading a commentary. Uh, first in the KJV, verse chapter 5, verse 16, it says, uh, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Uh, but we, I remember uh, on the last study, uh, I, I recall now that uh, I finished this entire chapter in the KJV because I wanted to say the entire ending because it was part of a a speech by Jesus that was, I think, very important, and I, we're going to go into it very carefully tonight, um, but I did read it. Um, so let me ask you now to just comment on this one portion here. I'll read it in the uh, Amplified, verse 16. Uh, it says, uh, For this reason the Jews began to persecute Jesus continually, because he was doing these, mir these things on the Sabbath. Um, there's uh, yeah. there's really there's really a lot more than just the Sabbath, but let's just talk about the problem they have with him doing this on the Sabbath. Uh, yeah. Uh, there seems to be a problem there, all right. Uh, and uh, we're gonna get to the bottom of it. I'm sure we will. Okay. All right. Well, the major, you know problem that they had is they just don't like their like their written laws and their traditions being you know violated all these you know Pharisees here because you know I don't think I was here for the last study but I remember he had just healed the man you know by the pool on the Sabbath and you know that goes against their tradition of being able to you know work on the Sabbath so well of course Jesus is God and he doesn't have to live by you know our rules but Still, like, these guys just, they couldn't stand, like, that type of stuff that was going on. And, you know, showing that, you know, and, of course, as we're about to see, 
you know, when he acts with authority, they're going to really, really hate it because, you know, they like being the authority. <coughs> Excuse me. But because um, a lot of these guys have pretty, well, as we've seen, they have pretty wicked and selfish hearts, most of these Pharisees, you know, wanting it to go like their way, and a lot of them want to seek their own praise. But in this instance, you know, this is one of their laws, and they hate it being broken because, you know, Jesus, as you know, is going right through them. Well, the um, uh, later on, we're going to hear a statement by Jesus, uh, uh, kind of summing up this whole problem. And he, and he he says that that you um, you you want to follow the letter of the law, but you don't understand the heart of the law. He said that they're straining out uh, gnats, but a swallowing a camel. In other words, they were, they're 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 all caught up in minutia instead of understanding their real purpose. Um, and you know that if, if we specifically look at this one particular command about, it says rest on the Sabbath, right? the Sabbath rest, and, and uh, you, you honor the Sabbath, keep it holy. But they, they extrapolated and said, well, that means you can't do any work. You've got to completely rest and just dedicate that entirely to study and worship and not doing any work. But they even... Uh, they took the Mosaic laws that were 613 of them, and 613 is, is not enough for, the, for them. Uh, the, uh, the rabbis, the Jews, the, the uh, Pharisees, the scribes, the really religious Jews, uh, they, they thought it's probably, probably like what happened in America, you know. I don't know how many laws we have. We probably have a couple of hundred thousand laws that the Congress has written, you know. Um, and every law is a piece of our freedom taken away. Every law says you can't do this, and that means you're not free to do it, so you lose freedom with more laws. Well, these religious Jews decided that Moses' laws were not enough. They had to even spell it out, even make it more difficult. And so they even said, not only can you not, you, should you rest on the Sabbath, but you can't even... Uh, pick up a, 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 an ob object that's bigger than certain dimensions. I don't remember what the dimensions were, but it had to be no bigger than certain dimensions. And and then if you carried it, you couldn't take more than a certain number of steps. If the object was too large or if you took too many steps, you violated it. You've worked on the Sabbath. So they, they got so legalistic and, and, and that that's why Jesus summed it all up as criticism of them is that, look, you're... You're, you're, you want to follow the letter of the laws, but you you don't understand the heart of the law, what the law is really intended for. So I'll, let me re get your reaction to that before we move on. That sounds about right to me. Also, Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay. Yeah, I agree. They were just doing it, you know, their way, you know, putting their own spin on it. But yet, you know, not really, you know, understanding kind of what was going on in that situation. All right, let me go again in the verse 17 in the KJV says, But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And in the Amplified, verse 17 says, uh, But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now. He has never ceased working and I, too, am working. So um, they're going to react to that, but before, let me see how you react to that statement by Jesus. Well, Jesus did have a job to do. He came to do a job, so uh, nobody could enter into his rest until he resurrected, I suppose. Does that sound about right? Okay, I guess I was going to let Luke answer that, but, um, all right, but anyway, my comment on that is, well, I mean, obviously, I do agree, he definitely did have a, you know, job to do, you know, he came here, and of course, he did the sacrifice, you know, that we couldn't do, and of course, you know, you know, he's God, you know, he's not bound by, you know, our laws, or any of that type of stuff, but, you know, his purpose was, you know, it was beyond, you know, great, because he was paying off, you know, the sacrifice, you know, for us, you know, he lived a perfect life and, you know, just everything. And 
you know, as he said, like, you know, the Lord God is working, you know, every day. You know, he does many things, and of course he is, you know, being the Son of God, you know, part of the same trinity is going to be doing, you know, just the same amount of work. So uh, I didn't catch exactly what Eric said except rest. Um, the Brother Ronnie, the hood minister, coined a term that I, I, I made a short video. It's like 90-second video or two minutes. I'm talking about the, the argument that people give us saying, um, you free grace believers who believe that you know you, you, don't, you don't have to work at all for salvation, no works are required, what you're doing is you're giving people a license to sin. And uh, Brother Ronnie said, no, what we have is a license to rest. Uh, we rest in Jesus' arms. We're confidently resting in this blessed assurance from our Savior. Uh, but Jesus is saying in verse 17 that the, his Father is working even today. And, and he's going to work today. So there's two, two important things from that verse. One, of course, he's saying that, that God is working on the Sabbath. And he's saying his Father, God, is working, and he, so therefore he is too. And further, further uh, claiming, making the claim that he's the Son of God. He's not the Son of God in a, in a broad sense like mankind is or that believers are. He's, he's making a distinction that, Father, that God is his own Father. Uh, see, uh, the Jews would never say, God is my father. The Jews would say, God is our father. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't dare to say, God is my father, because it puts them equal with God. If they're, and that's what Jesus was doing. By saying, God is my father, specifically, Jesus says, God is my father, and therefore, he claimed equality with God. And that's, that's one of the reasons, of course, Besides, besides him working on the Sabbath, uh, also this claim that he's equal with God, this is why they want to kill him. Uh, I'll move on, uh, but what do you say about that? It's pretty elementary, really, uh, and people just don't get it, and it's just ridiculous that some people don't get the deity of Christ. It's, it's a great shame. Uh, it's so simple. Okay, back to you. Yeah, I agree with what Eric just said, but yeah, like these, a lot of these guys, like these Pharisees, definitely weren't used to like something like this happening. Like someone talking with that much authority and claiming, you know, being equal with God, being God's son, even though this is completely true. So, I mean, they just want to, you know, be rid of it pretty much at this point. Well, we're about to look at it a little bit more, so I'll let us go on. Okay, all right. Uh, verse 18, the KJV says, I uh, know, ver yeah, verse 18 says, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now here's something I've, I've said. I, I, I know someone, one of our brothers here on YouTube, uh, Brother Sam, uh, Thick shades. I, I heard him emphasize this over and over again, and it's it's an important point to understand. Uh, I have a son, uh, Mark, and um, I'm a human being, and my son is a human being. He's and he's I'm no more human than him. He's equally human as I am. Uh, and that, that's the way it works with Jesus Jesus and, and, and the Father, too. Jesus being the Son, um, if he's the Son of God, then he has to also be uh, equally God. And uh, that's, that's why Muslims hate that saying so much. God can't have a son, is their claim. And uh, because they know, just as the Jews know here, that when you say you are the Son of God... That's a, you're making yourself equal. Uh, so here we have the, the statement that they say, it says there's two. They're going to seek. They're seeking to kill him for two reasons. He's breaking the Sabbath by doing 
even though he's doing miracles, even though he's doing something good, it doesn't matter. He's he's violating this legalistic viewpoint. You can't do any work on the Sabbath. And then, of course, he's also claiming he's God. I'll move on, but first react to that. Amen to that. And, of course, uh, all their accusations uh, probably came back upon them. Uh, they were all guilty of breaking the Sabbath. They were all doing stuff privately, and it, I see it all the time. Uh, hypocrisy abounds in these circles. Okay, back to you. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't have any anything else to add. Okay, I'm going to look at it in the Amplified before we move on. Uh, verse 18 in the Amplified said, This made the Jews more determined than ever to kill him. For not only was he breaking the Sabbath from their viewpoint, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Well, I think that their, uh, uh, their uh, amplification of this verse here, when it says, not only was he breaking the Sabbath from their viewpoint, uh, I, I think that's a, a good, good way of, uh, of distinction. He wasn't breaking the Sabbath. Uh, because what they turned the Sabbath into, as far as you know, uh, the commandment about the Sabbath, what they did is they they like put it on steroids and 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 to t totally change it to make it so rigid. And and Jesus also says, I uh, probably in the future point of John, he's saying that the Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath, you know. <laughs> It's like, we shouldn't be under this burden. Oh, yeah, you want me to rest? How can I rest? I'm afraid if I take the wrong step, I'm going to be breaking the Sabbath, you know? <laughs> All right, I'll move on. And it says, verse 19 in the KJV, Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. There's a little insight into uh, his relationship with uh, the Father, and uh, that's something that we can ponder uh, what that must have been like for uh, for him. Okay. Hmm. Well, looking at this, well, I mean, Jesus is pretty much he's saying that, you know, whatever, you know, he's doing, you know, and saying and all the things and the works that he does, you know, it's all, you know, of the Father. Of course, you know, God sent his only son, you know, for us, you know, to die in our place. So, you know, he's just fulfilling, you know, the works, you know, of his Father and, you know, what he has seen and what he was told to do in all this, in this situation. Well, I don't know if you were, used the word ro roles, uh, uh, Brother Eric. Uh, forgot how you phrased it, but it made me think of this, all this extra study I've been doing on early church history. And uh, the, the big, uh, say, debate and, and uh, the thought and the writing and all of the um, uh, commentary uh, – in the first couple of centuries, was really about what they call Christology, the study of Christ. How how, how are we going to explain Christ? You know, uh, um, what's it mean to be the Son of God? And and, and, and this this question of his deity, and then our Iranian saying that you know he was he was a man that that because he was able to live a perfect sinless life, he attained a state of, of God godliness, but uh, he wasn't. God originally created with no begin. I mean, he was created a man, and then he became God. And then the other side was no, he's God who came down. So, so did he elevate himself to a godlike state uh, from a man because he was able to be perfect, or did did he was he God who came down from heaven and reduced himself into a man? Uh, but all the, this for a couple of centuries here. This is the argument. How do we define this? question of Jesus, his deity, his humanity, and uh, one of the things, and I have a playlist that uh, 
also that I did about six months ago or a year. And the question, this, the title is Eternal Sonship versus Incarnational Sonship. And that's very interesting too. You, if you want to take some time, it's about, probably about 10 hours long. Um, but much of this also question is the roles. Does is the son subordinate to the father? If he, he's if he's eternal, uh, and then some people say, well, he's not eternal. He's the first begotten. That means he's the first thing that God created, and then and then through Jesus, God created everything else. Uh, but my position that I will will divide over is no, he's eternal. He has no, he is the uncaused cause. Nothing caused him to come into being. He is the unkind cause. He is the eternal God Almighty. But what about the different roles that play between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Uh, are, is the distinction really not in godliness, not in eternality, but in roles that they serve? The, the, did the Son willingly say, yeah, we're, we're all equal, but I'm going to subordinate myself and I'm going to do the will of the Father, and I'll reduce myself to a man, and I'll... So he took a subordinate role to the Father willingly. And so uh, that's a question that I think could be looked at uh, because this verse is talking about the work, the father, Father's working today, and even I'm going to keep working today. And I, I thought you said something, Brother Eric, the way you phrase it, that made me go off on that tangent. But... How did you phrase it again? Uh, I can't remember now, but uh, I guess you could say he was a spitting image of his father. All right, I was waiting for Brother Stephen to stick, put in his two cents, but I guess he doesn't want to speak, so I'll move on. Well, I just didn't know I was... I didn't think think it was my turn at that point. <laughs> All right, but I don't respond really... respond to what I just said if you if you do have a response. Otherwise, I'll move on. All right, I'll let you go on. Okay. All right. Um, verse nineteen. I'm going to look at the amplified and see how it phrases it. So Jesus answered them by saying, "I assure you, and most solemnly say to you." The son can do nothing of himself of his own accord unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever things the father does, the son in his turn also does in the same way. Uh, I think the way that they are phrasing it here uh, kind of makes that distinction between the, the, the son having a subordinate role to the father and doing what he can't do anything unless the father is uh, sh showing him or telling him. Uh, okay, I'll move on here to verse uh, KJV verse 20. The Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. That's 20 and 21. Well, that just reminds me of a, a little kid following his father around and just doing everything his father does. We see that all the time, and it's beautiful. All right, well, when I see... I know I see this, you know, and he will show him greater works, you know, than these, you know, that you may marvel. When I think of greater works in this situation, I mean, Jesus has already performed, you know, many miracles. But, you know, I'm thinking about what he's about to do, you know, in the future when he, you know, dies, you know, and rises again soon. Because, you know, looking at the next verse, you know, as it says, For us the Father raises up the death and quickeneth them, even the Son may quicken it to him well. Well, obviously Jesus will prove this, but... You know, this just reminds me of what's, you know, to come pretty much, you know, in the future. But when it comes to um, showing, you know, himself all the things that he doeth, and of course, you know, Jesus is here, you know, showing that to others. 
Um, you don't have anything uh, to say about the, this verse uh, uh, talking about the subordination of the sun, uh, the, the point that I was making earlier? Mm. I'm not 100% clear on that type of stuff as of right now, but mm. I'm still thinking about that. Just say you concur. Uh, I don't want him concurring uh, unless he do really does. Uh, we've got to be careful before we start concurring with people, you know. Even, even, uh, even me. I don't want anybody to concur with me automatically. If you're not sure or if you think I'm wrong, I want to be challenged. Um, okay, so. <laughs> Let me see, that was verse uh, 20 and 21. Let me read it in the Amplified. For the Father dearly loves the Son and shows him everything that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will be filled with wonder. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life and allows them to live on, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Now, when it says the Father raises the dead, in verse uh, 21, for as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them. Uh, what is that referring to? Can you think of any example? Uh, my mind's a blank right now, but I know we can pull something uh, out of the hat here. Uh, Stephen, what do you got? Mm. Hold on, before I actually give my full comment, could you read verse 21 in the Amplified one more time? Okay. 21 in the Amplified says, uh, Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life and allows them to live on, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Well, I mean, looking at that verse... When I see new life, I think about, you know, the eternal life that, you know, Jesus gives to all of us, you know, who believe on him and who've accepted the gift, you know, that he paid for us. And, of course, you know, Jesus, obviously, you know, he paid the sacrifice completely. And so, you know, he's the one, you know, who gives it to us, and he's passed that on, you know, to Jesus. As he says, Jesus has this. We'll talk about this, I know, in a couple of verses up ahead, but that's what I think about when I think about quickness, like in this verse. Okay, so it says, as the Father, let me see, let me read it again, because I want to, for as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, quickeneth them, uh, has, have, have there been any resurrections up to this point? Uh, have we, I don't know if we've gotten to, my mind's gone blank if we've gotten to, no, nope, we haven't gotten to Lazarus yet, so um, I can't think of any, you know, up to this point, but I know there's going to be some coming up. Uh, yeah, let me respond to, I wanted to say this earlier, but uh, you said in an earlier statement, Brother Stephen, that uh, Jesus had done a lot of miracles up to, uh, up to this point, and... Uh, I guess I need to correct you on that. In John chapter 5, he really hasn't done very many miracles up to this point. In fact, the only miracles I can recall that he's done up to this point in John chapter 5 is the turning the water to wine and this healing of this man at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, I don't recall any others. Maybe I'm missing one, but uh, he hasn't fed the 5,000 or the 7,000 and he hasn't healed the blind man, uh, uh, and, and he, he hasn't he healed the lepers, and he, he hasn't done a lot of the things we know he's, he's going to do. Uh, but my question is about the resurrection of the dead. He hasn't healed, raised Lazarus, or Dorcas hasn't been raised. Was Dorcas Jesus, or was that uh, Peter? I think it was Jesus, Jesus raised Dorcas, too. But when it says the Father raises up and quickeneth 
and then the son does quickeneth who he wants to, uh, what's it referring to? That's what I'm trying to get at. Is it something in the past, or is it something in the future that this verse is referring to? Well, I mean, if we're talking about this tense, then it's going to be what's about to come up, you know, in the future. You know, especially when we talk about, you know, Jesus' resurrection. I'm not quite sure, Brother Luke. I've never contemplated it. Uh, something like this usually takes me uh, uh, a few nights uh, to contemplate before I can really come up with something. What do you got on this? Well, um, you know, we, we, we always give glory to Jesus for performing resurrections. And we also know, I believe, Peter. It was Peter who raised Dorcas. So... Peter raised someone from the dead too, um, but but before Jesus, the, there was at least one. I think there are a couple examples, and, and one I'm pretty sure of, it was Elijah raised someone from the dead. Uh, and so there there was at least one or two examples in the past of a resurrection, but then also we have these two factions of religious Jews called Pharisees and Sadducees. And uh, what was the primary distinction between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, if you can recall? Yes, Brother Luke, I remember Chuck Smith used to say, the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in a resurrection. I honestly cannot recall at this point. Okay, I, I want you to be more specific when he says when you say they didn't believe in a resurrection. What do you mean? Well, by that? I meant the resurrection of the dead, which is uh coming soon. Praise God. Okay, back to you. Yeah, I, I still want more of an explanation of what that is, but let me give our brother Stephen a chance to talk about that. Um, I mean, as I just said, I do not really. Re I know I. I've learned this before. I just can't recall it right now, so I just can't really say anything too much at this point. Okay. Um, the the Pharisees and Jews as a whole uh, believed at the end of time that uh, God would raise all of mankind from the dead, and and there would be a bodily resurrection, and that God would there would be a judgment. Um, that's, the Pharisees believed it. Uh, the Sadducees, as Brother Eric points out, um, they did not believe in any future bodily resurrection. Um, they were Jews in a respect, but for some reason they did not accept that. As uh, I don't know every doctrine and nuance of the Sadducees, but we, they're famous for not believing in a bodily re future bodily resurrection. So what I'm getting at here is that uh, it was common for everybody to believe, even the uh, even the Samaritan woman at the well, remember her, uh, uh, Jesus talked to her about the resurrection, I believe, or, or I, I can't remember for sure, but I, I don't know if it was just uh, life everlasting or, or uh, living water and never thirsting again, but I, I thought he might have re referred to the resurrection. But it, it was commonly believed by the Jews that there would be a future resurrection of all mankind and then a judgment. Uh, so I think this verse here is referring to that. It's not referring to any resurrections Jesus has performed, because up to this point uh, in the book of John, he hasn't done any. Um, we know, of course, Peter's resurrection of Dorcas didn't happen yet. And then they could be thinking back about Elijah or one of these resurrections in the Old Testament, but I think he's really referring here to a future resurrection where mankind is going to be raised and all of mankind, the, the just, those are the people who will be justified and God lets them into heaven because of their faith and those people, the resurrection of the un, unjust, which those are the people that are not justified because they didn't have faith in God to save them. Instead, you know, they believe something else. And uh, uh, so there, that's the resurrection, I think. Let me read it again and see if you, you think that's the right context for this. 
it says, for as the father, father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them. Now it sounds like the father is doing that, like, oh, he's doing that all the time, the way it's phrased here. But I don't think it's talking about it. And even so, the son quickeneth. See, the son quickeneth whom he will. That sounds like, well, the son's going around quickening, re re resurrecting people right now. But this is a, the way it's phrased gives, could give you the wrong impression. But this is talking about how Jesus and the Father uh, will have the power to, uh, of resurrection power. And, and I'll read it in the Amplified too to see how that fits. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life and allows them to live on, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. All right, uh, I'll move on unless you want to say anything more about that. I think that's an acceptable uh, point of view, Brother Luke. Uh, Jesus often spoke of uh, things in eternity as if they were uh, now. Okay. Yeah, I, th I like that. It's a very you know interesting thing that I never really thought about before when I looked at this. Of course, you know, I see what it says, how he quickeneth whom he will, but when you talk about the Father raising up the dead and quickening them, that looks, it feels like that just applies to all, so that definitely would be what's going to happen, you know, in the future. All right. Uh, I'll move on here. Verse 22 in the KJV says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. 22 and 23, comment on that. Okay, we can take that at face value. But now, uh, somewhere Jesus later says that uh, he doesn't judge anyone else either, but uh, that the word that he speaks will judge him. Uh, are anybody familiar with that? I do remember that, but um, hold on. It looks like Luke has something to say about that. Uh, I, I think the next few verses, if I remember, uh, will expand on your point there a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, let's just stick up to these. This what he says right here, even though he's going to elaborate on it further. Okay. Um, oh, wait. Did you have something to say, Eric? I was just going to reiterate uh, that we can take that at face value. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I do agree with this. You know, all judgment you know, has been given to the Son. You know, those who believe on him, obviously. But, yeah, and that comes through, you know, and I think about you know faith in Jesus. How it says you know all you know all men should honor the Son you know, even as they honor the Father. You know, then he that not does not honor the Son, you know, does not honor the Father. Because I mean, we already talked about him being you know no less than God. You know, earlier in our discussion, but you know at this point, you know, you know Jesus is you know God in the flesh. You know, the Messiah. So you know, and he's been giving his commandments, and he even says everything that he's comes from, you know, the Father. So, literally, I mean, I feel like there's no way you could honor the Father if you don't honor, you know, Jesus, and, you know, do what, you know, he says, you know, at this point. Yeah. Well, the first part about when you when you were a little confused here about, wait a second, I thought Jesus didn't come to judge. No, he said, I did not come to condemn the world. That was in John three, say, like uh, 15 through 18, I believe. He said he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Uh, who is this? Oh, it's Neo. Hi. Hi, Neo. Hey, brother. How are you? Pretty good. How are you all? Uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas, if you believe in that kind of thing. Um, and <laughs> uh, how are you all doing? I've got my tree up, of course, you know. I'm, I'm blasting this, but whatever. Good to well, see you, Neo. How are you doing, Eric? 
real good. All right. Well, I'm glad that you're able to join us. Uh, we, we've missed you. I've been watching you, uh, some of your activities on you, YouTube and Google Plus recently, but uh, I was hoping you'd join us again, so welcome back. Um, have you been listening at all to the conversation? Um, unfortunately, I just stepped in. I'm going through some of the things now. I always keep an extra tab open on the on the Hangout before before I join in. All right, we're in John uh, chapter 5, verse 20, 21 right now. But, uh, okay, let me answer this question. Oh, getting back to your question about if we believe in these things like holidays and celebrating Christmas stuff, uh, I did make a video about question is uh, celebrating holidays. I just I just uh, shared that a couple of days ago, too. So you can get my opinion on holidays uh, by watching that if you want. But here's the thing. Uh, uh, he says he didn't uh, come to, uh, how is it phrased here again, uh, 21. Um, but the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. And then Brother Eric was thought, well, I thought he, the Son didn't come to judge. But no, it said in John 3, 15 through 18, I think, he, the Son did not come to condemn. He's not, he's not going to condemn, but the, con, the, the, the son is going to judge the world in righteousness, uh, you know, if you put your faith in him or not. Um, but here's the thing that's really important about these verses here. It says that, for as the father, uh, no, it says, uh, that all men should honor the son, I'm on verse 23, that all men should honor the son, even they honor the even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Now, this is something we need to talk about more deeply here. Verse 23, I'll give you guys first chance to give your thoughts on that. Uh, Stephen, I, I'd like you to uh, meet Neo. Neo, meet Stephen. Hey there. Let's say it's Stephen, known as Stephen Rivers TV on YouTube. <laughs> What's up? How many? Oh, you must be popular, huh? Eh, somewhat. Okay, that's enough of that nonsense. Okay, guys, listen. This is a big problem. A lot of uh, this is where a lot of uh, people go astray. They don't give honor to Jesus, the honor that is due him, like the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons. Etc. Etc. Okay, back to you. Well, I mean, Jesus is God's son, you know, and His only son. And obviously, we already talked about, you know, His deity. So, I mean, people obviously will place their trust in, you know, many other things besides just Jesus. So, I mean, a lot of the times people just put, you know, too much trust in, you know, you know, as I used to, you know, in just their in themselves, you know, trusting in, you know, their own works. You know, instead of just, you know, following, you know, his word, you know, and what he's given us. Because, you know, as Jesus said, you know, everything he is is just like the Father. And, you know, just not following that, you know, you're not following, you know, the Father either. Okay. The, uh, remember, so, so far, um, the, the previous verses have been talking about, they wanted to kill Jesus because he's breaking the Sabbath by doing miracles, by working, and because he's saying he's the Son of God, making himself equal with God. And here we have another statement. It's just a different way of making the same claim, that he, you've got to honor the Son just as you honor the Father. Now, you know, we know that all the glory goes to God. We don't give glory to prophets, to, to uh, you know, fellow believers. We don't give gl glory to the angels. All glory goes to God. That's solo, sola gloria. And, and, the, and the, the Bible says that God doesn't share his glory. And yet it says that he and the Father and the Son are sharing their glory. So when Jesus is saying, if you don't honor the Son, then you don't honor the Father. Uh, this is... Another way of saying the same thing, he keeps on like rubbing it in their face about this claim of deity, equality with 
God. And, uh, you know, he's saying it in a variety of ways, but that's going to get them fired up to want to kill him, you know, as it said in the previous verse. It also is a distinction between Islam, they don't honor the sun. As a matter of fact, they don't even believe that God has a son. That's one of the main tenets of Islam, is that you've got to denounce and say God has no son. Uh, that's the, that's a, also in with Jews. Jews deny the son. They don't honor the son. Therefore, they don't have the father. The Jews believe they think they believe in, in Jehovah God Almighty, but they don't because if they don't honor the son, they don't honor the father. So this is a very important thing in terms of doctrine, but it's also another outrageous claim, another way of Jesus making this claim of deity. I'll let you go on. Before I go on, I'll let you respond to that. I concur, Brother Luke, and I'd like to hear how uh, the rest of the group feels. I agree, too. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you've got to praise Jesus. You know, uh, he is, he's, he's the way. He says, I'm the way, the, the truth, and that, that is the way to the Father. All right, I'm going to move on here. Uh, did I read that? Uh, I'm going to read that in the Amplified, verse 23. So that uh, it says that, uh, for the, verse 22 and 23, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment, that is, the prerogative of judging, to the Son, placing it entirely into his hands, so that all will give honor, reference, homage to the Son, just as they give honor to the Father. In fact, the one who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who has sent him. So that makes it even more clear. Uh, now I'll go to the KJV and read the next verse, uh, 24. <clears throat> Jesus is saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen, Brother Luke. This is one of those, uh, this is actually one of the seven thunders. It's the preeminent thunder. Believe. Just believe to be saved. And it, uh, it's irrefutable. Okay. I mean, yes, I... Oh, wait, does Neo have something to say? No, go ahead. All right. Sorry, I just heard you coming on. But um, one of the things that really sticks out to me here, you know, in this verse... I mean, yep, so obviously it's about, you know, just the believing, just the significance of just, you know, hearing his word, you know, and taking him at his word, and, you know, believing in what he did, of course, in his gospel. But it also talks about right here, you know, the fact about the security, like the eternal security we have in him right here. Because it says here, you know, you have everlasting life. It says you had it. It's yours. And it says that you will that you won't come into condemnation, and you are passed from death into life. You know, past tense, you have been you know brought to life. You know, after you know believing. So it's just saying that you know you have life, and you know, and you're not going to lose it. You know, at this point. I was just waiting for uh, Neo to get a chance. To, I, I just uh, pause for each person to get a turn to speak before I go and carry on. But if you don't have anything to say, I'll move on. But uh, I'm glad that you brought that up. That's what I was hoping that you, uh, someone would say, because uh, this is a a verse that tells us uh, that we, a person should understand from this verse. It says, um, "You, if you." When you believe, you have you have everlasting life, and shall not pass, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So there's there's three things here, three phrases that are absolutely proof texts for the fact that salvation is instantaneous. It says, whoever believeth on him hath everlasting life. Now, if you have everlasting life. Then it lasts forever. It's everlasting. You don't have to worry about it, you know, being cut short or losing it. 
uh, and it says, you shall not come into the combination. This is another of those promises. When we talk about when you believing in Jesus for salvation means you believe in his ability to save you exclusively, and you believe in his faithfulness to keep his promises. Uh, and so here's one of his promises. It says, you shall not come into condemnation. So when you believe on Jesus, he promises you, you're never going to come into condemnation. And then he even goes on to say, but is passed from death unto life. In other words, you've already passed. It's already been done. You've gone from uh, you know, death, which was the, 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 your future destination being the second death. And instead, you, you've, you know, you've passed from that, and now you come into a new life, everlasting. So, uh, yeah, Brother Stephen, uh, I'm glad that you uh, uh, saw that. That's very, very important to gain from this verse here. Uh, before I read it in the Amplified, does anybody want to say anything about it? I'll add a little bit. Uh, yeah, uh, that is the core thing. Like you say, the core, th core. Um, what do you call them? Core belief. You know, core uh, things that you have to do. I mean, there's not really much to do except for believe in what Jesus said. I mean, when he said it, when it comes to the core essentials to Christianity, that is definitely the number one thing: is is hearing the word and believing. And that's what this says. I'm glad you uh, expressed the hearing part. It's important that people need to hear the gospel. If they don't hear the gospel, they can't be saved. Okay. Yeah, and the promise, you know, of eternal security is, you know, in my opinion, probably my, probably one of my favorite parts of the gospel. I mean, obviously, it's actually it's really tough to just, you know, argue against any part of it or not like any part, but. Because, you know, Jesus paid all the work for us, and all he asked us to do is just believe. You know, there's nothing we have to perform. But the fact that we're just guaranteed, you know, eternal security in him, you know, it's just amazing. But, you know, people love to argue against it and say that, you know, that, you know, you have to deserve it or that it's never, you know, guaranteed. But, if, like, especially when you look at verses like this, I mean, you prove it out of the mouth of Jesus himself. We have eternal security in him. And there's no way you can lose life, you know, once you have it. You are past, like, you have everlasting life and will never come into condemnation. Of course, I got another verse on that, but I know we'll get to that in a few minutes. All right, I'm going to read this also in the Amplified to see how it phrases it. Uh, verse 24, um, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, the person who hears my word, the one who heeds my message, and believes and trusts in him who sent me, has, that is, possesses now eternal life. That is, eternal life actually begins. The believer is transformed and does not come into judgment and condemnation, but has passed over from death into life. I think they did an excellent job uh, amplifying that verse there. Uh, anything else before I move to the next verse? Good job uh, on the Amplified. They, I agree with you. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, you know, there's nothing more than uh, the, that kind of core belief for me. I mean, there's obviously some other things that we should do, but when it comes to a core essential, like this is the core essential, is that hearing the word and believing it. Believing Jesus. I mean, that is to me. That's the that's the first thing that I had to do. Yeah. Amen. Okay. Uh, I I thought about going on to the next verse, but I think that we need to end this now because we need to uh, allow a little time for a, a salvation invitation. So uh, that was verse 24. I'll make a note here that we'll pick up in John 5. 25 next time we we discuss John which will probably be five days from now because now we got five different Bible studies going on here um, okay um, let me uh, lay the groundwork here uh, as I've said so many times the, uh, um, the there, there's so much to be learned from the Bible uh, we're studying the the book of Proverbs and we're learning wisdom. We're studying Job and learning about 
his trials and we're, we're learning so much about that and the trials and tribulations in our lives uh, we're starting about early church history and then here in John the book of John it's uh, to me as I said at the very beginning of these studies on John that if I if I was uh, told that I must choose one book out of the Bible everything else would be destroyed it would no longer exist I had I could only save one book it would be the book of John uh, because it, John says he wrote this book specifically for the purpose of telling us how to get eternal life. Uh, uh, so of all the things you can learn from studying the Bible, this is the one thing that is of utmost important, importance. And that is, do you, do you want to go to heaven after you die? Well, do you know what you've got to do? Do you know what is required of you? And that's that's what we want to tell you now before we end. It would be negligent, it would be horrible if we did a Bible study and, and didn't tell you what's most important. And here's the problem though. Most people in the world today, most people who have ever lived throughout history have believed the devil's doctrine. And that is that if you're if you work real hard to become real religious and you die, God will might say, Well, you've done well enough, I'll let you into heaven. And for those people that didn't do well enough, were not quite good enough, they end up in hell. It's, it's, it's the, uh, the doctrine of personal merit. So the first thing we want you to understand is that's a lie from the devil. The Bible tells us we don't go to heaven because of personal merit. If it was based on personal merit, we'd all end up in hell because we all fail. So uh, that's why the gospel, which is just a Greek word that, that translates to good news, the good news is that salvation and eternal life in heaven is offered to everyone as a free gift from Jesus Christ. Free gift. Now, if you understand that and believe that, you should be standing and jumping for joy and shouting hallelujah right now. If you understand and believe that it's not based upon your efforts, and if it was, you could never succeed, you'd fail. And, and because of that, because God loves you so much, he is going to give you salvation as a free gift from Jesus. But we want you to know a little bit more about this, and Brother Stephen loves to tell you that more detail, so I'll let him speak a little more about this. All right, everybody. Well, I like how you know, Luke led into this. You know, that's the problem with the world is a lot of people like to talk about, like, believe in, you know, many, you know, wrong things. Like, there's the gospel of personal merit. Of course, there's other, you know, you know false gods and stuff out there. But, yeah, but one of the biggest things I've seen is definitely, you know, people thinking, you know, they have to earn their gift of salvation or people thinking, you know, that they have to be righteous enough. Well, I'll start off by saying that no one's righteous. For as it says, you know, in Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous, you know, not even one. You know, and as it says in you know Romans six twenty three, the wages of sin is death. You know, all of us are sinners. You know, it doesn't matter you know how you put it. You know, our works won't get us anywhere, and there's nothing you know we can do. But I'm going to read the second half of that verse now. Romans six twenty three. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and that's the good news of the gospel. And you can sum it up in a nutshell by reading John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, you know, Jesus came to do what we couldn't do. You know, his father sent him. You know, he was fully man, fully God, came here in the flesh. You know, he lived the perfect sinless life, you know, that we couldn't live. Now, I may have been wrong about how many miracles he performed up to that point tonight, but he performed many miracles showing who he was. You know, like raising, let's say, Lazarus from the dead, turning water to wine, you know, and he, you know, like restoring the sight of a blind man, you know, and many others. And as it said, he had the power to quicken us who he will. And he proves that later because he dies, he was buried, and then he rose again. He proved he was God's son when that happened. He proved everything he said was true. But when he died on that cross and shed his blood, he pinned all the sins of the world on him. He, as God, came here and tasted death, the penalty you know, that we deserve. And 
Although, of course, anyone who rejects Jesus, you know, it's not just a physical death we have. It's, you know, eternal death, you know, in hell. But Jesus came here and tasted a physical death, something he didn't deserve, something he didn't have to do. But he came here and just paid off our debt, you know, in full. And he offers us the free gift of eternal life to those who just believe in him. As it says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And, you know, as it says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, Jesus, this is the great news of the gospel, not just the good news, the great news. Jesus came. You know, we can't do it. He came and did it. He paid it all. He died for us and then bought us the gift of everlasting life with his blood. And he's giving it to us freely. And all he asks us to, believe, to do is just believe on him. You know, trust in him alone. Put all your faith in him. And not in yourself. And as it said in Matthew 18, 11, for the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost, which is what we are. You know, we were lost, but we come to him, and we're found, and we're saved. And another great part that we've already mentioned, but I have got another verse to back it up, is our eternal security that we have in him. As it says in John 10, 28, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You know, once you believe on him, you're saved and saved forever, and it's all just because of the gift that Jesus paid for with his blood. So that's the invitation I give out to every one of you. Stop trying. Stop trying to do it yourself. Just come to Jesus and just take the free gift. Come to Jesus, believe, and live. And that's all I have. All right. Uh, thank you. Well done. And I, I hope that if you're watching this video, you listen carefully and you understand that uh, Christianity is not based upon you joining a religion and becoming a religious person and following some set of religious rules. Christianity is based on this. You, com you rely completely on Christ for your salvation. And if you can put your future in his hands, trust him to get you to heaven. Just as this icon here demonstrates trust Jesus to get you to heaven, uh, then you've satisfied what, what God requires of you. Uh, let me uh, ask everybody just to make a, uh, their good night word and any final comments on this, the study for tonight. Thank God meeting uh, Stephen. I added you, by the way. Um, yeah, what you said uh, has inspired me. I've, I've heard this um, before. Uh, he has our, he already... <laughs> Uh, he was amazing as a child. He was amazing the teachers and the rabbis. I mean, and he already knew what he had to do. So I imagine being in the, you know, that that's pretty insane. That's pretty amazing to me in the, in the first place. And yet you can't change yourself for him because he already knows who you are, no matter who you think you are or what you do. He he knows your heart better than you do. So I mean, to, to try to change yourself for Jesus isn't gonna affect who he already knows who you are anyway. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, God bless and all that. Thank you. Yes, and I am too thankful for this group of men that can understand the plain and simple message of scriptures because it's so important and it's so irrefutable. Okay. And as it says, you know, in Romans 4, 5, you know, if you believe on him who justifieth the ungodly, which is Jesus Christ, even though you worketh not, your faith is counted as righteousness. And Jesus said that the work of God is just simply to believe on him, which is, you know, the free gift of salvation. So, again, that be, that's all I, you know, say to you tonight. If you don't know Jesus, you know, if you haven't believed on him, you know, I just pray that you trust on him today, that you come to him and believe on him today, and nothing else. And All right, brothers, thank you for uh, thank you for participating tonight. Uh, I hope everybody will join me nightly for at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and um, uh, I also ask you to look at the description box in this video. In fact, all of my videos, I put the same thing in the description box, and that is this: my statement of faith, which are the core doctrines of Christianity, and also. Bible verses that support 
these claims that we've made tonight about salvation being a free gift. All right, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.